O Lord, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Let them bring us to the mountain of thy holiness and to thy dwelling place. For your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Bow down thine ear, O Lord, and hear us. For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to our prayer and attend to the voice of our supplication. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. Please rise. Glory and might be unto him for ever and ever. Amen. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Please join me in reading the two great commandments. The two great commandments are, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Please be seated. And now reading from the word of the Lord, as it is written in Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 10. Then they set out from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea in order to bypass the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient on the journey and spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you led us out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. The Lord sent venomous snakes among the people, and many of the Israelites were bitten and died. Then the Lord came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord, so he will take the snakes away from us. So Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. If anyone who was bitten looked at the bronze snake, he would live. Amen.
And now reading from the word of the Lord as it is written in the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 21. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born from above. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time to be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh is born of flesh, but spirit is born of spirit. Do not be amazed that I said you all must be born from above. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. And yet, you people do not accept the testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, How will you believe it when I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so it behooves the Son of Man to be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. The light has come into the world, but men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light. For fear that his deeds will be exposed But whoever practices the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen clearly that what he has done has been accomplished in God. Amen. And now, finally, reading from the word of the Lord, as it is written in the Apocalypse Revealed, number 49. Since the Son of Man means the Lord in relation to the word, it is apparent that his feet mean the word in its natural sense as well, which we dealt with at length in the doctrine of the sacred scripture and also that the Lord came into the world to fulfill everything in the word and to become thereby an embodiment 
of the word, even in its outmost expressions. But this is a secret for people who will be in the new Jerusalem. The Lord's natural divinity was also symbolized by the bronze serpent that Moses was commanded to set up in the wilderness so that all who had been bitten by serpents were healed by looking at it. That this symbolized the Lord's natural divinity and that those people are saved who look to it, the Lord himself teaches in John. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The serpent was made of bronze because bronze, like fine brass, symbolizes the natural self in respect to good. Amen. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them, by the breath of his mouth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Jesus has just cleansed the temple, shocking and most likely enraging the Pharisees, and yet here is Nicodemus, a Pharisee, coming to Jesus, wanting to know more about him and confessing that he knows, they know, God is with him. Though he meets Jesus under the dark of night, he nevertheless does meet him. We are all Pharisees in some way. We all have Pharisaical states. At times we use faith and religious knowledge as a throne for judging rather than a stool for washing one another's feet, a door to keep people out rather than a key to open our hearts to all people, a crown of laurels rather than a salve from the healing leaves from the tree of life. The only way to not be a hypocrite is to admit to being one. None of us are anywhere close to being perfect. None of us are good. The solution is not to try harder to be perfect. After all, the Pharisees excelled at being perfect. The solution is to admit that we are wrong. The solution is to be humble before the one who is perfect, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is exactly what we see in Nicodemus, a Pharisee, humble enough to acknowledge the power and goodness of Jesus, divine love revealed, and so divine truth itself. The old temple of faith alone is crumbling, and the Lord is already raising up his new living temple, faith and love in the spirit of those humble enough to bow their pride before him and brave enough to prostrate their fears before him. The Lord has touched and begun to heal even the most intractable part of us, the Pharisees, the pride of the self. We are still moving in this spiritual nighttime, but we are moving towards the one true light. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born from above. Nicodemus isn't so obtuse that he wouldn't understand the Lord's meaning, especially since the adjective usually translated as again almost always means from above. His fear of the message made Nicodemus hesitant to hear the message. The Pharisees inside of us seek to reach heaven from below, from hard work, purity, true understanding, and good works. Essential as these are, this tower erected upon the self will never reach heaven will never know love. Of themselves, these are a great statue of our own pride, which an uncut rock will strike and turn into dust. 
the same rock which the builders rejected, but becomes the cornerstone upon which the Lord builds his church, Jesus Christ, God incarnated. We must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. We must daily cleanse ourselves, but not for purity's sake, for love's sake. We can stop, uh, that we can stop harming the Lord, harming others, and harming ourselves, so that the Lord can find a home in us, and so that we can build our house upon the rock of his words, all of which are about loving others by loving God, and loving God by loving others. When he is the motivation in what we do, the house of our mind will withstand the storms of lower earth, of the lower self, sorry, and life on earth. Earth no longer sweeps away our spirit. Once we know the heaven of the Lord's goodness given to all, we have a new motivation that is not governed by circumstances of the world. This is to be born of the spirit. The lower self cannot comprehend the motivations of the spirit, which like wind, origin and destination are unknown, going where it will, moving above the earth. As Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness and all who gazed upon it were healed of the venom of the fiery serpent, so it behooves the Son of Man to be lifted up, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. The serpent is the lowest of all animals, an emblem of the lowest of all that comprises the human being, the sensorial, which so easily becomes the sensual. Bronze or copper, the least of precious metals, is an emblem of love in the natural plane. Jesus Christ is the expression of the one God in the natural level in such a way that even our sensorial mind can apprehend him. He has reached down to this level because this is the level into which we are born, the level where we fall victim to the venom of sensuality and poison of belief in the self as having a purpose and power other than to be a vessel of the Lord's love. If he has told us earthly things and we do not understand, how can he teach us heavenly things and we believe? When we look to him as such and kneel before him as God, as a template for how to live our lives as the healer of our heart and soul, he is resurrected indeed, he is lifted up for his spirit then lives on in us, inspires us, and makes us truly alive. As Elisha took up Elijah's mantle after he rose to heaven in the fiery chariot, leaving no body, so we take up the mantle of the Spirit of the Lord and receive power to be a blessing in ways that we could no otherwise do. He is risen as the good and truth within all people. He is still the visible human, God expressed in the faces of those who love selflessly and who speak the truth. He is the all and all that is. In the beginning was the word and all was made that was made by him. And all of this rests on the truth of the ultimate incarnation and expression of God's love, who is Jesus Christ, his life, his death and his resurrection. The Third Testament shows that the entire word speaks of him and speaks of his presence alive in human race, in heaven and on earth. It reveals his spirit, the spirit of truth. Yet this spirit cannot be divorced from the body, the natural level of the word. The name Jesus represents divine love and Christ divine truth. The word's natural sense is the flesh, it is the bronze serpent. Whether you say that serpent is the literal meaning of the word or the historical Jesus Christ, there is no difference. For he was the physical incarnation of the word, 
in divine human natural form. And conversely, every word throughout the literal sense of the word, Old, New, and Third Testament testifies and bears witness to Jesus Christ as the one God of heaven and earth, incarnated and so eternally visible in human form. Is this true? In Numbers chapter 24, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come forth from Jacob, and a scepter will arise from Israel. He will crush the skulls of Moab and strike down all the sons of Sheth, our pride. In Isaiah chapter 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people rejoice before you as they rejoice at harvest time, as men rejoice in dividing the plunder. For in the day of Midian, you have shattered the yoke of their burden, the bar across their shoulders, and the rod of their oppressor. For every trampling boot of battle and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of his government and increase and, and peace there will be no end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from that time and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And from Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord Yahuwah is on me because Yahuwah has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of Yahuwah's favor in the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to console the mourners in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahuwah, that he may be glorified in luke chapter 4 the lord jesus christ says of this passage today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing in the first chapter of john we read in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the word became flesh and dwelt among us in chapter 8 of the same truly truly i tell you jesus declared before abraham was i am in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus replied, Philip, I have been with you all this time, and still you do not know me. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me, performing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on account of the works themselves. In Revelation, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was to come, the Almighty. In the Third Testament, True Christian Religion 344. The underlying reality of the faith of the new church is one, trust in the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And two, confidence that he saves those who live good lives and believe the right things. In 791 of the same, 
After this work was finished, the Lord called together the 12 disciples who followed him in the world. The next day, he sent all of them out to the entire spiritual world to preach the gospel that the Lord God, Jesus Christ, reigns and that his kingdom will last for ages of ages. Also, that people who come to the wedding feast of the Lamb are blessed. This occurred on June 19th, 1770. In number 25 of the same, because God cannot be received by anyone such as he is in himself, he appears as he is in essence as the sun above the heavens of the angels. But that sun is not God himself. He himself is in the sun as a man. He is our Lord, Jesus Christ, both in regards to the divine origin and the divine human since the very self, which is love itself and wisdom itself, was his soul from the Father, and so divine life, which is life in itself. This is different in the case of any person. In us, our soul is not life, but a receiver of life. The Lord teaches us this too when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In 838 of the same because God at the level of his essence is burning with a love of uniting himself with us, it was necessary for him to wrap himself in a body that was adapted in such a way that we could receive it and enter into a partnership with him. Therefore, God came down and took on a human manifestation according to the divine design that he himself established at the creation of the world. His conception occurred through an offshoot of his own power he was carried in the womb, was born, grew in wisdom and love, and came closer and closer to his divine origin until he was fully united to it. In this way, God became a human being, and a human being became God. The scripture about him, which the Christians have, and which is called the word, clearly teaches and testifies that this is the truth. God himself, whose human manifestation is called Jesus Christ, says that the Father is in him, and he is in the Father, and that anyone who sees him sees the Father. There are many other such statements. In Secrets of Heaven 5502, we read, the Lord is present so fully in the word that he is the word. The Lord's two names, Jesus Christ, entail the same. The name Jesus entailing divine good, and the name Christ divine truth. From this, it is also evident that the Lord is present in every part of the word, present so fully that he is the word itself. The natural level of the word which speaks of and is Jesus Christ, and the natural level of Jesus Christ, which is the human fulfillment and embodiment of the word, is lifted up when we open the door and he enters into communion with us. It is difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. We cling to the riches of our understanding, our purity, our work, our deeds, not wanting to sell all that for the pearl of great price, who is Jesus Christ. These so-called riches of selfish fire bite us and inject deadly poison into us. It is difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, but with God, all things are possible. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the cure, the anti-venom. For to submit ourselves into the service of the Lord Jesus Christ shatters the pride of self-intelligence, because to believe in him goes against all earthly rationality, but opens our eyes to the rationality of love. He shatters the pride of self-reliance and wrongful appropriation because we welcome, because we become his servant. He shatters pride in our good works because in his life on earth, we see divine infinite love for all people, which ignites the fire of a new desire to love and do good that is clearly outside ourselves and so superior to any prior motivation that there is no ratio. And we see the dross of those that came before. He shatters our indifference and apathy for his love so moves us that we can't but try to love likewise and try to obey his new commandment that we love others as he has loved us. He is the door to heaven. And so he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And this is the verdict. The light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever practices the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen clearly that what he has done has been accomplished in God. Nicodemus from within the darkness of his night did come to that one true light, Jesus Christ. He came to hear his word. Nicodemus, once timid, and in the dark is changed and emboldened by him. He becomes a brave man, risking reputation and position to defend Jesus Christ. From John 7, we read, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoken in this way. The Pharisees then replied to him, you have not been led astray too, have you? No one of the rulers of Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, the one who had come to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge the person unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? And Nicodemus became a rich man beyond belief. Now after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, requested of Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred liters in weight, litras about 75 pounds but a hundred means fullness so they took the body of jesus and bound it in linen wrapping with the spices as is the burial custom of the jews some calculate that nicodemus's anointing oil was worth the equivalent of about two to three hundred thousand dollars in today's economy yet one litre of the same type of ointment was worth about thirty thousand dollars about which Judas complained bitterly when he anoint, when Mary anointed the Lord's feet, the natural, with it. Being 100 litra, which represents fullness or all, Nicodemus' anointing oil was worth 100 times this amount, a value of $3 million. Regardless, the point is clear. Nicodemus sold all he had for the pearl of great price, who is Jesus Christ. With God, all things are possible. He gave all he had to anoint the most external, natural level of the Lord, his physical body, the natural sense of the word, which declares Jesus Christ to be God. That apparently lifeless body of Jesus Christ resurrects He is indeed lifted up, and so it is that all who gaze upon him and believe shall be healed. Amen. And now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Be gracious unto me, O God, according to thy mercy, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, 
and uphold me with thy generous spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.